Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A respected chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have to commit to uh, make this presentation online for you, send it as a recording, largely on account of some personal reasons because of which I will not be able to participate in person. The title on which uh, I'm supposed to give this presentation to you is Fountain of Hope from Habilitation to Rehabilitation. Now, this particular uh, title has been inspired by the uh, theme of the conference uh, that you and I uh, have opted to participate in. My, from my side, more online and you are there in person, lucky you. Uh, why did I choose this topic? Primarily because of the fact that the idea of rehabilitation in mental health and in psychiatry is very well understood. It may not be very well executed, but each one of us who is a mental health professional understands what we mean by rehabilitation. However, there are two aspects that are central to the concept of rehabilitation, but however, are not so well understood. And therefore, I took it upon myself to highlight to you uh, these two themes. The first of those themes, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that largely we as mental health professionals seem to be most often and most frequently than not are performing our duties in a reactive way. When we see patients, it is often when they're extremely ill and their families think that they now uh, need some work and they're brought to us. Whatever the pathway to the care is, which is very convoluted. Consequently, once they reach us, it's often very, very late. Not because we were not there uh, to look after them, they reached to us very late. So at the end of the day, the bottom line is that we do intervene in terms of treatment. We sometimes also have access to wonderful facilities like the Fountain House in Lahore, which is there in some parts of the world in Pakistan, but not always there in every part that where we practice. If there is no access to institutions like Fountain House, we uh, make adjustments and try to highlight, provide informational care or counseling and support to the family and ask them to intervene and help our patients as they recover to rehabilitate. What we do not really understand is that this reactive way of responding to mental illness sometimes can be so late that the outcomes may uh, not be as bright as we would like them to be. Now, is there a way that we can change this situation and scenario? Yes, we can. If we understand the concept of allostasis. Now, I don't know how many of us actually understand the concept of allostasis uh, and how many of us uh, do not. Therefore, I'll just take a couple of minutes to highlight to you what do we really mean by allostasis. Allostasis is a concept that became uh, familiar to the word consequent to work that started in 1980s. And in that work, it was said that normally what we are familiar with is a term called homeostasis. Now, human beings are designed far more superior to earthworms and ants uh, and other birds and animals who have the capacity to undertake homeostasis. However, on account of this superiority in the evolution ladder, human beings can actually preempt and plan ahead of a stressor that is coming their way to plan their response to that stress and make possible the exact and precise homeostatic changes that need to be make in needs to be made to actually deal with that stressor when it arrives. This approach of preempting 
a homeostatic adjustment, a use of a particular defense mechanism, use of a particular method of dealing with trauma, dealing with grief in advance is a function of the frontal lobe, particularly the prefrontal cortex. And this decision-making center of our brain makes adjustments in the body in advance so that an effective and precise homeostatic adjustments can be made. This concept of preemptively preparing human body, both in terms of neurological, neurohumoral, as well as immunological mechanisms, is what is therefore uh, a, a phenomenon that comes into play through uh, the concept of allostasis. The typical um, example of allostasis would be how we are dealing with COVID-19 at this point in time. We are immunizing ourselves. This is the concept of immunization is an allostatic concept that we understand that at some point in future, because we are dealing with a pandemic, so at some point in time in future, we are likely to get an exposure of COVID-19. So we want to prepare ourselves in well in advance as to how we are going to eventually deal with it. So we give small doses of the of an attenuated virus or its proteins, and therefore the body is already prepared preemptively to give a robust response to that uh, COVID-19 exposure as and when we get it. This approach is a typical example of allostasis. Now, does it really mean that we have not as yet understood this concept of immunization in psychiatry? This to me is a phenomenon which is as important as rehabilitation but since the whole concept of mental health immunization is not there in us, we therefore never really use it. I'll give you exact examples of how allostatic mechanisms can be used in the protection of mental health, in the promotion of mental health, in the prevention of mental illness, at all levels of treatment of mental illness, and eventually in the rehabilitation process also. But all those mechanisms are uh, allostatic mechanisms that we often do not really employ. That's the first part uh, of my talk where we'll try and highlight to you the importance of allostasis in mental health, uh, rehabilitation and treatment. The second uh, part would be to highlight to you the concept of habilitation, distinctively different from rehabilitation. What is the difference? The difference is that in rehabilitation, we are trying to help a patient regain the skills that he has lost on account of the mental illness that he is experiencing. So X developed schizophrenia on account of schizophrenia, uh, lost his job as a banker, his uh, ability to uh, conduct himself occupationally as an effective banker, lost his capacity and ability to sustain himself socially, also uh, as a husband, as a father, as a citizen. He lost his ability to handle certain circumstances and situations effectively and therefore falls out of job. Now, once he recovers from the mental illness, during the process we initiate his return to his job. We try to help him regain those skills that made him an effective banker. This process by which he will regain what he had lost on account of schizophrenia is rehabilitation. As compared to that is the concept of habilitation. Now, habilitation, however, is a process which aims at helping people gain certain new skills that they would now require in the years to come after having experienced schizophrenia. Now, these new skills, uh, knowledge, gain of uh, a certain uh, skills to enhance his living following the process uh, of going through schizophrenia, the challenges that schizophrenia throws at this patient at the level of his, uh, his social existence, at the level of his um, interpersonal communication with people, these new skills were not with him when he had experienced schizophrenia, but he would now require them 
on account of uh, the challenges that have been thrown to him on account of um, uh, schizophrenia. For example, before he had uh, not developed schizophrenia, he required skills to be an effective citizen, an effective husband, an effective father and a good banker. These were the skills that were enough for him to lead a regular life. However, after schizophrenia, as we know, schizophrenia having a certain negative symptoms in his life is going to now give him a residual schizophrenia state. And in that residual schizophrenia state, he's going to have challenges of communication. He's going to have challenges of handling emotions and emotional circumstances and situations. And he's also going to have challenges vis-a-vis -vis processing of certain types of cognitions. He might need to also now have certain skills of handling chronic auditory hallucinations. These new skills were not required before he or she developed schizophrenia. So this set of new skills that he is going to now require to live a productive life would be called habilitation. So the foremost thing that we as mental health professionals need to understand is that alongside rehabilitation, we would have to have a deeper understanding and use of allostatic mechanisms and plans in our treatment and rehabilitation processes of our patients. And we would have to understand the concept of habilitation or acquiring of new skills after an individual has been challenged by a particular mental illness. Now, I promise to you that I'll give you some details of what are some of the allostatic mechanisms or allostatic arrangements that we can uh, undertake at the level of the society, at the level of high risk families, families who are genetically predisposed or on account of certain psychological traumas that they've gone through, migrant populations or war-torn area populations, those uh, populations that have been challenged by other major uh, challenges like tsunamis and earthquakes. We know that all of these populations would eventually become high risk populations for developing certain kinds of mental illnesses. Then we know that there are certain kinds of individuals who are likely to develop mental illness. For example, individuals who are marginalized in the society on account of their gender preference, people who have been um, marginalized on account of their psychosexual preferences, individuals who are uh, users of certain drugs, for example, IV drugs. Now, all these individuals and sometimes even organizations require certain types of skills to ensure that they are able to prevent mental illness. They are able to promote their mental health at the level of the society, at the level of the individual, as much as at the level of the families, high risk families. And uh, these are those allostatic skills that I'm going to list for you, which if available to these high risk individuals would make them preemptively less likely to, to develop mental illnesses in the years to come. So this aspect is often missed. And uh, these skills include, uh, number one, what I would call uh, child rearing practices that can enhance resilience in an individual. What are those child rearing practices? Now, I've given elaborate talks and uh, have set up my own uh, channel in which I'm trying to highlight the child rearing practices based on the seven types of quotients that we need to inculcate uh, in our children. And those seven quotients uh, which can be nurtured in a child very early in his life include the intelligence quotient, the emotional quotient, the cognitive quotient, social quotient, spiritual quotient, and finally the moral and attitudinal quotients. Now these seven quotients can be incorporated through certain types of uh, child rearing skills, which we can, uh, uh, you can access on my YouTube channel and uh, you would find the details of it there. Alongside life skills like mindfulness, like building healthy interpersonal, healthy internet based relationships, for example, are extremely important in today's world. You and I know about 
the challenges that the uh, internet based relationships throw at people and how they can be traumatized completely on account of those internet based challenges uh, relationships teamwork skills how to work in imaginary teams that are not even around i mean they're not geographically present around you yet you're part of that virtual team now this is a skill that is going that's not present uh, with us because we are not really trained for it however the word particularly the post covid word is going to have more and more of virtual teams working together people sitting in one continent working with people sitting in another continent and they would have to interact with each other now if they are not going to be trained in this uh, virtual teamwork skills are likely to, to get into what we call a high allostatic load which is going to make them far more vulnerable to develop stressors and those stresses are going to then serve as predisposing factors uh, and precipitating factors to develop various kinds of mental illnesses uh, investment in personal health personal happiness is a protective technique people who are happier have been shown consistently to have a better mental health and better outcome of mental health as well uh, some of these newer habilitation tools uh, are something that all rehabilitation centers need to develop for themselves uh, the habilitation tools that uh, need to be incorporated in the existing rehabilitation services include adult day services like particularly respite for carers of mentally ill patients now we do focus on patients and i'm sure uh, excellent uh, centers like fountain house in itself focuses on the on the patients perfectly fine but do not really provide much for the carers and the families of those patients so when you're going to provide adult day services that are inclusive of the families and the uh, the carers that is going to actually be a habilitation tool they are now skilled they have acquired a new skill falling schizophrenia or chronic schizophrenia and this uh, new uh, uh, set of skills that individuals have the carers have and the families have is going to is, is likely to make the relapse uh, in this particular patient far less uh, common as compared to what we have right now uh, home and community based psychomotor skills development programs simple things like uh, we, we know that it is not possible for a patient of schizophrenia or may not be possible in all patients of schizophrenia to return to their job as a software engineer after they've had uh, a major uh, level um, you know challenge to their front lobe and psychomotor skills to develop or write a software program but if they are trained now to become hardware specialists of, of computers, if they learn how to make a chip, that's a new skill that they've acquired as part of the habilitation process and they can still be in the computer industry. Now, this will be a habilitation process. Counseling, therapy, behavioral support services, handling emotional pain, handling fear of living with a mentally ill patient in a family are those new skills that this family needs to develop but have since they've never been exposed to uh, a similar circumstance or situation in their family uh, before they don't have that skill so are we running enough uh, workshops skills trainings for families and the carers to overcome emotional pain to overcome failure to overcome um, fear and paranoia uh, that is instilled in these families where there are potentially violent patients. Supported community engagement services where families are linked with each other and they provide mutual support to each other. There's a huge concept of joint families in Pakistan, which are obviously which is obviously disintegrated. There's, there's a concept of mahallas and a mahalla spirit in Pakistan. Yet that mahalla spirit to actually look after a patient who is chronically mentally ill are those services that we've not ever really utilized. How to help families with a patient of dementia, chronic mental illness, mental subnormality, and so on and so forth uh, through engaging the mahalla uh, in the joint care of this patient. 
how to coordinate care how to make sure that the care process in itself be, does not become a stressor and increase the allostatic load in an individual who is fine otherwise shares the same genetic makeup but the allostatic load that has now happened to after becoming a carer of a patient who has already broken down can lead to a breakdown in this next patient so if we are going to ensure care coordination that he does not get all the stress of being a carer and his stress is distributed amongst various family members and mahalla members is the simple tool of care coordination uh, can be a great advantage uh, to carry as a habilitation tool how to actually administer uh, medication to chronic patients of mental illnesses uh, the famous uh, my dear friend said farooq's work on directly observed treatment in patients of schizophrenia the dots program which has been widely published and appreciated in the world is a classical example of medication training and support these are only some of the tools that i have highlighted which can bring a new dimension to the concept of rehabilitation in mental health one of the projects that my great teacher may his soul rest in eternal peace professor malik has hussain mubashshir sitara imtiaz hilal imtiaz uh, who died last year on 10th of august before he left this world he had conceived a, a program which he named khaimay wafa he had heavily invested in a project called khaimay wafa which was actually a plan to include rehabilitation alongside allostatic and habilitation processes in place a three in one please uh, uh join me to know more about this project and we'll be happy to share uh, the theme this particular theme with all of you this particular concept of khaima wafa where habilitation allostasis and rehabilitation are brought together particularly focusing on those vulnerable populations who have been abandoned by their family members in the society completely is what professor bashar has envisaged may uh, god give us courage as his students and followers to complete this project that he had started in his life thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i'll be delighted to answer any questions that you may have uh, after the chairman uh, allows me to do so thank you